The question of who really wrote Shakespeare's plays is a controversial one, and Ross Barber has opened the debate again with her new novel, The Marlowe Papers. Ros, this must be a, a dream come true for you, because you've been writing for a long, long time, since you were nine, I believe, and yeah. you know, finally you've got recognition. Yeah, it is, it, it, my dreams seem to be coming. Um, I actually just wrote an email to my agent today saying more and more dreams are come true every single day. There are just, you know, there's lo just lots of aspects of it that are so exciting, this whole build up to the launch and getting reviewed and yeah, so I'm loving it. It just gets better and better at the moment. I'm just savouring every little bit of it because it has been a long, um, a long time in the wilderness, you know. I'd done a long apprenticeship and I'm ready now, I'm ready for this. I was ready, I was ready for it about 20 years ago, but I'm really ready <laughs> now, you know, yeah. So before this was published, I think you you really put everything into it. I mean, you you really um, you mortgaged your house. Yeah, is that right? I I I had a, a a very good mortgage deal that allowed me to draw down on the mortgage. And when I mm. took it out, I thought, well, I'm never going to use that. I didn't know then that I was going to write the Marlowe papers and that I was going to need to live off that. Mm. And so I borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed, and then it got to the point, and I had finished the book. Um, but I calculated that uh, at the at Christmas that I really only had until June, and then my if there wasn't any more money coming in, I was going to be out of the house. That was going to be the end of it. So I got fairly close to it. That yeah. June was the cut-off point, and my book deal came through in the March. So <laughs> I was very relieved, mm -hmm. um, and it was great knowing that I didn't have to go and live in a tent at the yeah, end of someone yeah. else's garden. Yeah. But you must have really believed in it then. Did you always think this is going to be worth it? This is going to get published? I could never piece? guarantee that it was going to get published. Mm. Obviously, when you write a novel in verse, you're not really going for an obvious commercial winner. Mm. I just, I was just obsessed with it. It just felt like something that I had to do, and I couldn't not do it. And I, and I've also got to the point where I'm sort of rather unqualified to do anything else mm. but write. Um, and I just had to trust and believe that, that it, well, one way or another, that it would all work out. I just mm. had to sort of, I did feel like closing my eyes and, and jumping, really, yeah. and hoping that I would land well. <laughs> yeah. Coming back to that point about the novel being written in poetry, obviously there's been um, quite a lot of debate recently about the subject matter, about Marlowe and Shakespeare. There was a film, Anonymous and there have been other novels written about Marlowe. But the real talking point about this is you've written a novel in verse. That's particularly what's unique, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it has been done before, and it has been done successfully before, but not very often. I think the last big one that people remember is um, Golden Gate by Vikram Seth. But it's not what you do if you want to write a commercial proposition. Mm. Well, for a start, one of the things I did um, was when I read the other fictions, particularly Anthony Burgess's uh, Dead Man in Deptford, it's such a fantastic novel and the language in it is so rich and I thought well I can't possibly compete it's like the ultimate prose novel about Marlowe has already mm. been written um, and I didn't want to draw any comparisons with that yeah. and but because I was writing this one in the first person I was writing it as if I was Marlowe um, and in order to get some kind of authentic voice for Marlowe the only authentic voice for Marlowe I know is from the plays and they're written mm. in iambic pentameter so I felt like it just felt natural to me that if he was going to write his own story he would do it in verse. Mm -hmm. And this at the time iambic pentameter as blank verse was quite modern wasn't it? I mean Relative, it was a relatively new development in the theatre and until and although it had you know there were blank verse dramas before Marlowe uh, he was the first person to really make it work. Mm. He was the first person that made it, you know, um, more interesting and dynamic and less repetitive. Mm -hmm. He re essentially brought it alive and paved the way for Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. 
And it, at the time, so that's, that's a very contemporary style, really, he was writing it. Up to the minute, yeah. yeah. I mean, now, of course, I'm writing in a style that's 400 years old. But, uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, you know, I wanted to... Because I wanted to write it in contemporary English and not make it cod Elizabeth and not make it difficult to read or understand mm. for the contemporary reader. I didn't want to make it like Shakespeare in that respect because that, people do find Shakespeare difficult. Mm. Um, so I wanted to write contemporary English, but if you write... It, it, if if that was in prose, it's quite difficult to make that sound Elizabethan. Whereas if you mm. just write it in the metre, even though you're using contemporary language, it, it quite easily starts sounding quite Elizabethan because that's the language of Shakespeare. That's what we're used to is that rhythm. So. Yeah, yeah, it it does feel very familiar. Doesn't that was, so it was for me. It was an easy trick because it's something that I I do fairly naturally anyway. I have quite a lot of experience in writing in that metre. So mm -hmm. and. Yes, you're a poet um, as well as a, a novelist. Yeah. So do you think because you've written an awful lot of poetry before that that really came naturally? That was kind of your your natural voice. It's like breathing, verse. really. It's almost hard not to write in ambient pentameter. Although mm -hmm. I will be writing the next thing I write in prose, but <laughs> um, it's very very easy for me to get into that rhythm. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't the biggest challenge. And was this quite a big step away from what you've done before? Because you've done quite a few public art commissions with your poetry. Um, you've done some very personal poems about your mother. And this is very literary. Well, I I'm tired of writing about my family. And I think they're tired of me writing about them as well. Um, and I was already tired of that. Um, but one, it is, in a way, this did come out of my public art commissions. Because one of the commissions I did was for the Isle of Sheppey. And I did some quite long narratives there that I'd taken, um, that I've done some historical research for. And there's one in particular that was from the Nor Mutiny of 1797. Um, it was a first person story retelling that historical tale from one of the people that was involved. And I loved doing that. And, and people responded really, really well to that. It was only a 10 minute poem, but it's quite long in poetry terms. Um, but I, I loved it. I went to the British Library, I did the research, I got involved in it. And that's when I decided I really wanted to do more of that. And I would love mm. to do something longer that was also had a historical basis, mm. taking a, a first person perspective and retelling some history differently. Mm. So yeah, it came out of the public art really. Yeah. You've also done a PhD on the subject of Marlowe and authorship. So is this a kind of creative side of your academic research? It was. I mean, my, my PhD was part creative and part critical mm. and the, writing the novel in verse was just over half of my PhD as submitted. Mm. Um, it was a rather over-length PhD because I then <laughs> did 50,000 words of critical writing as well about the authorship question and Mm -hmm. um, addressing that, but uh, yeah, it was it was brilliant fun to be honest. I really <laughs> didn't expect it to be um, as the research side of things to be as much fun as it was. I really got into to doing the critical writing as much as I enjoyed the creative. Mm. Is this a kind of fantasy? What if this had happened, or do you actually believe it? Yeah, people do ask that. When I I first came across the idea in a documentary that I saw in 2005 and I'd never been exposed to the idea before that anyone other than Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare and I just thought what a terrific story just imagine if you were the author of these incredible works but you couldn't lay claim to them because you're supposed to be dead and if you pop your head above the parapet you might still be dead um, so, you know, I went into it just thinking, what a fantastic story. What was really interesting about the research was finding out the reason why there is a certain amount, of, not in some quarters, there's a great deal of certainty in many quarters about who wrote Shakespeare, I appreciate that, but um, but why there are, there's, there continue to be a large, uh, a fairly large number of people who do doubt Shakespeare's authorship. And the, 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 what was interesting is that there is good reason for that. The, the evidence, the first sort of primary source evidence to support Shakespeare of Stratford's authorship is very poor, very, very poor and doesn't compare well with other authors of his period. And it is very interesting how you can take the all these bits of evidence, historical evidence, and knit them together in a different way. I mean, but, you know, that's what I was doing. I was saying, here's all these dots of evidence and here's the story we have at the moment, but it does mm. leave quite a few things uncovered it doesn't join all the dots up mm -hmm. and that's why there is um, skepticism because there's so many things that are inexplicable whereas the um, 
the Marlowe story, you can write it such that it joins a lot of dots up. Mm. And, and I, you know, yeah, the, where I've come to with it is that I wouldn't say, oh yes, Marlowe wrote Shakespeare and I can prove it. Um, that's not true at all. You can quote me out of context and recut that one and then <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuffed. But no, um, what I would say is it's just not as ludicrous as it at first mm. seems. It isn't completely implausible. It's not completely implausible that a man who's arrested on a capital crime, you know, in, uh, could very easily have been killed for the things that he's recorded as saying at the time. Mm -hmm. He has means, m motive and opportunity mm -hmm. to fake his own death. People are faking their own deaths even now for much more minor things, not necessarily in fear of their life, yeah. but just to escape credit card debt or bad marriages and things like that. It's a lot easier 400 years ago mm. before you have, you know, photographic passports and fingerprinting and DNA and cash point cards that you can trace people's movements with and things like that. It's much easier to disappear 400 years mm. ago. And, um, you know, it's not completely ludicrous that he would do so. Um, so that's really where I'm, I'm at with it. I want to sort of say, well, it's not just... It's not, not as stupid as it sounds. And I wanted to spin a, a fairly plausible retelling, you yeah. know. And um, it, it is fun. I mean, people do get very exercised about it. They mm -hmm. do. Uh, some people get rather angry. Um, <laughs> uh, and I appreciate I don't want to um, rattle anyone's cage or um, genuinely upset anybody. I do, you know, it is a work of fiction. It is fun as far as I see it. I hope it's fun, I hope it's entertaining. Um, but yeah, the, the story behind it intrigues me and I and I make the point, and I do have these notes if you're interested in reading them at the back of the book, that just show the sort of skeleton that I've put the flesh on, that mm -hmm. show how you can construct this alternate reality. Yeah, I'm sure the debate's going to continue in academia and outside of it in the media well, I hope so. I would actually, there hasn't been any debate in, in academia to speak of. I mean, there's only one academic in the UK that I know that is a Shakespeare sceptic who's in an English department anyway. I mean, I think there's a few outside um, of English departments. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it's not done to, to doubt mm -hmm. Shakespeare's authorship if you're an English academic. Um, and there is no debate. I was invited to a debate at Sussex um, to... Um, the debate was, should the question be asked? Mm. Should the authorship question be asked? And I was there to argue that it should be asked. Um, and unfortunately, the debate got cancelled the day beforehand. <laughs> but generally, there isn't debate um, because it's considered to be a fact that mm. Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. So there's nothing to debate. And anyone who believes otherwise is obviously an idiot, mm. is, the, is the line. Um, got, there's been some very famous idiots, like <laughs> Sigmund Freud and Orson Welles and mm. Henry James and, you know... Ted Hughes as well, I'm perfectly saying rational people have mm. had reasons to um, look at the evidence and think there's something perhaps a little fishy there. Mm. So, but it's not, I would like to, I would like there to be debate. I would like uh, the academic community to engage with this. I'm not sure how realistic I am in that wish, but I think it's, it's an interesting question. <laughs> You're going to read a little bit from your work, aren't you, Roz? I am. Love. If you'd asked me yesterday, I'd say, love is a sore that amputates the heart. I'd call it my disease. I'd call it plague. But yesterday, I hadn't heard from you. So call it the weight of light that holds one soul connected to another or a tear that falls in all gratitude, becoming sea. Call it the only word that comforts me. The sight of your writing has me on the floor. The curve of each letter looped about my heart. And in this ink, the tenor of your voice. And in this ink, the movement of your hand. The Alps now cut their teeth upon the sky and pressing on to set these granite jaws between us, not a mile will do me harm. Your letter in my coat will keep me warm. Mm -hmm.